Hello, welcome to this Rural Doctors webcast. I'm Simon Stokes, thanks for joining us. This program focuses on oncology and we'll hear from four different clinicians to try and get an overview of what's happening across the whole field of treatment. In a while, we'll hear from paediatric oncologist, Dr. Kathy Cole, and medical oncologist, Dr. Martin Bach, about advances in treatment and management of cancers in people of all ages. We'll also talk with radiation oncologist, Dr. Raphael Chi, who spoke about the recent resurgence of brachytherapy as a preferred mode of treatment for some cancers. But first up, we're going straight to the head to discuss what may well be one of the most difficult of diagnoses for many of our patients, and that's brain tumours. Dr. Olga Ward caught up with neurosurgeon Dr. Arul Bala and asked him if he had any good news for us in relation to the treatment of cancers in the brain. Arul, welcome to the program. Thanks, Olga. Nice to be here again. Arul, what would make you think of a brain tumour? All those patients that certainly we see pounding headaches and fatigue and odd, vague symptoms that are there sometimes and sometimes not? Well, generally brain tumours present in one of three ways. They either cause a seizure, um, they cause a neurological deficit such as a hemiparesis or visual disturbance, or they present with raised intracranial pressure, so mm. worsening headache, particularly in the mornings, um, and nausea and in severe cases vomiting. Um, I think in any of those cases, uh, you don't necessarily have to scan up front, but th th you need a follow-up system and plan so you eventually investigate them. Mm -hmm. But those are the sorts of things that, that might save brain tumour. In terms of a neurological deficit, are you always talking something that persists or can they be quite intermittent at first? Well, that's a good question. I mean, in early stages, it's very subtle. They might have a, a pronator drift, mainly due to some edema near the motor cortex. Okay, now um, when, when you say a pronator drift, Mm. That's a, a term I vaguely remember from medical student days. Can you just elaborate? Yes, yes. It's basically a, a tendency to um, revert to the stroke position, so where the um, anti-gravity muscles win out. So if you ask them to hold, out, outstretch their arms and close their eyes, what you'll see is a pronation, a flexion of the arm, internal rotation and adduction. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of final posture you see in okay, hemiplegic so yeah, patients. Okay, so it's a stroke patient. Yeah, and they'll slow, slowly drift in that direction. So. That's certainly something we could test for. Yes. Yeah. And then if as a country doctor, I see a patient who's say had a first fit or has some odd neurological signs that I'm not sure about, and I'm going to have to send them somewhere to get some imaging, should I just order a CT scan readily available to, well, more readily available to a GP? Or if I'm going to send them some distance, am I going to get much more bang for buck if I request a, a private MRI scan? Uh, I guess it depends on each case. Uh, presumably the majority of first seizures have a, a normal a CT or MRI scan. So, I mean, if you're uh, in a rural setting and you don't have access to an MRI, I think a CT for a first seizure is quite adequate. Mm -hmm. um, although I would recommend a clinical follow-up thereafter. Uh, a CT scan can miss small tumours, uh, low-grade or even early high-grade tumours. And in my experience, I've certainly seen patients who presented with that first fit uh, and had that scan and it was normal. CT yep. scan and subsequently with progressive neurology a, a second scan has identified a large glioma or something and these yep. are all aggressive pathologies. So a close clinical follow-up after the first scan is, is fine yep. by me. Now when you say close clinical do you mean sort of in three months we should look the patient over or in three weeks we should look the patient over? I'm thinking over? four to six weeks. Yep. And what kinds of things would you be testing for? clinically? I think, you know, just reverting the, to the history side of things, just ask for questions regarding any raised intracranial pressure, so any persisting headache, uh, early morning nausea uh, or vomiting, um, and particularly a headache that's worse on laying down uh, or in the morning uh, or on exertion. Um, and um, we can examine them for any um, subtle neurology. Uh, and I think between the two of those, you'd have enough information. If there's any doubt, I think a repeat imaging, particularly an MRI, is not unreasonable. Yep. And I think that it's completely guided, guided by your clinical judgment. Once you've got a patient who's got some kind of brain lesion, um, certainly for a GP, you know, we're often the person breaking the news to the patient. And that's 
pretty scary thing regardless of whether it's a benign or a malignant tumour. Do you have any kind of set information that you give the patients and what sort of, what sort of hope can you give them once they've got the words brain and tumour in the same sentence? Uh, absolutely. I think those two words with something positive on the imaging uh, triggers a journey for the patient, uh, which is generally loaded with a lot of misconceptions. Uh, so for, I think uh, seeing them early from a specialist perspective is important, even if it's simply with a CT. Yep. Um, a positive CT you can easily look at and identify whether it's uh, something high grade, low grade or benign, generally. Yep. Uh, so you can have an early conversation with the patient to try and alleviate their anxiety and give them some information. But uh, ultimately an MRI scan is what you need. Uh, and it's a difference between a black and white and high definition TV. And then I can sit down with the patient and fairly confidently discuss what's going on. What sort of prognosis are we looking at? What's, what's the course of patient with a brain tumour these days? I guess it's completely dependent on what the actual pathology is. Mm -hmm. um, now if it's an intrinsic or primary brain tumour, uh, the WHO still classifies them as grade one, completely benign, uh, to four, mm -hmm. uh, malignant with medial, median survival nine to twelve months. Yep. Uh, you can generally say if it's a three or a four, or a one or a two uh, on the imaging, I, I think about 90% of the time. Yeah. But ultimately, tissue diagnosis is what's necessary. Yep. So ultimately, this patient's going to go for a brain biopsy of some description? Well, the conversation absolutely is, uh, well, do we watch and wait? Th that's always on the table, particularly if it has all the appearances of a meningioma yep. that's small and asymptomatic. We can watch it mm -hmm. and wait till the hand is forced by either any evidence of growth or, or patient anxiety. Uh, for an intrinsic brain tumour, the conversation will be a, a timely operation and whether it's biopsy, a debulking or an aggressive surgical resection. Yeah. Now when you say aggressive surgical resection, there's an enormous amount of intermittent publicity on the, on the standard media about, you know, brilliant cures achieved for brain tumours and I've always wondered how many brilliant cures do you achieve with aggressive surgery? Well, um, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think um, as surgeons we need to understand one thing, which is uh, we're fighting a disease that needs to be fought at a molecular, cellular, genetic level, mm -hmm. not with steel. Yeah. And all the papers that suggest surgery benefits patients are written by surgeons. And uh, look, uh, at the moment, we're standing at the edge of a cliff or at the forefront of neurosurgery where if a patient presents with a lesion, we still aim to achieve a aggressive radiological resection where possible. Mm -hmm. So if it's a, a benign, for example, a grade one tumour such as a pilocytic astrocytoma, you want to take that out. Mm -hmm. You want a complete resection because that will cure the patient. Yep. And these are usually young patients, either children, adolescents or young adults. Uh, and the lesions are usually in the cerebellum uh, or okay, less commonly in the, in the hemispheres. And if you let it go or if you leave a residual, it will grow back yeah. and cause future mor morbidity. So there is a real importance of curing a grade one. And you can do that surgically? Yes. I mean, at the moment, given the low grade nature of these pathologies, uh, there's real, generally uh, no, with some exceptions, there's generally no role for chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And your slightly more aggressive tumours, what happens with those? Well, um, let's look at the grade two tumours. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got some slides here of a young patient um, who's a crane driver, 26 years old, presented with that first seizure yep. uh, in a rural uh, setting. And uh, the CT scan identified a three centimetre right frontal low grade glioma. Uh, and subsequent MRI shows it's very well circumscribed. And there are specific sequences on the MRI scan that you have to look at. Um, first of all, it doesn't enhance with contrast. And the flare sequence uh, suggests it's very well circumscribed, which is not the case with the higher grade tumours, the grade threes and fours. And uh, yes, in look, in those cases, again, there is no urgency for immediate surgery. This is a low grade pathology. It's been there for a long time and you have to have that conversation with the patients but in a timely manner, aim for total surgical resection. 
and uh, at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital we're in the process of building an intraoperative MRI scan mm -hmm. which will maximize our ability to resect in one sitting. Uh, but it's got huge lifestyle implications for the patient. As a crane driver with a single seizure, you can't operate a commercial vehicle for 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. So they have to change occupation. So it's quite a disaster for the patient. Even if he lives, which it looks like he will. Yes, yes. I mean, you'll <laughs> yeah. see the, uh, the post-operative scan showing a near total resection. But even along the margins, you'll still see some fluffy changes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the nature of these intrinsic glial tumours, which is at a cellular level, the pathology exists not just where the MRI shows you, yep. but in distant areas. And quite commonly, it's a communication with other parts of the brain through the white matter tracts that communicate within different lobes of the same hemisphere or through the corpus callosum with the opposite hemisphere. Yep. And disease progression, as we will see in uh, the high-grade cases, can quite commonly be in the opposite hemisphere. Mm -hmm. and so it just kind of crawls along the nerve tracts? Absolutely, and look, we're still learning more and more about it, but people do accept that in the subependymal layer, around the uh, surfaces of the ventricles, mm -hmm. there is evidence of stem cells, and I think even in the adult brain, we still, uh, we should um, uh, consider that neuronal differentiation still occurs, and there is um, uh, growth and development of neural and glial tissue, which presumably leads to neoplasia, as opposed to the older thinking that we have a finite uh, number of cells, neurons. And they just uh, differentiate and sit there and that's it and then yes, they die. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in, and in lab studies, people are learning how to de-differentiate neuronal or glial cells back to the stem cells. Uh, so there is, there's a lot of new knowledge coming out regarding the actual pathophysiology of this. Mm -hmm. So this patient with the low-grade glioma, would not require any additional treatment or would they also have to consider chemo or radiotherapy? Well, I mean, this is a really important uh, change in treatment in the last few years uh, where ordinarily, whether you had did a biopsy, a debulking or a total resection of a grade two or a low grade glioma, one would simply have annual surveillance scans. Mm -hmm. But there is uh, literature to be published in the near future um, from various international centres which do suggest upfront chemo radiotherapy for patients that really anyone short of someone who's under 40 with a total resection mm -hmm. should have upfront uh, chemo radiotherapy. Yep. And what about the high grade tumours, the very bad news patients? Is there any better news for them? Um, I think the genetic uh, typing of these tumours is allowing us to identify, particularly with IDH, uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase mutations. The, if identified, uh, those patients tend to have a better prognosis, but it's still a terminal or a fatal disease, a grade four tumour. Yeah. So how much time can you buy them? It's, how much quality time can you buy them? It, I mean, look, it, this is a good question. Uh, in my experience, uh, a patient that presents with um, no deficit mm -hmm. tends to do better. If they present with any kind of a motor deficit or cognitive dysfunction, you know, confusion for example, they don't do well. Uh, but it's hard to predict. We know the median survival is around about 9 to 12 months. Um, it's, it's such a mixed bag. Uh, I, the literature suggests, and again it's written by surgeons, that if you achieve a 99% plus resection, people live longer. Uh, but it's not um, dramatic. Uh -huh. Is it any clear, clearer whether they live any better? Or do they just uh, breathe longer? Oh, look, you know, I think uh, each patient is completely different. Um, a high grade glioma is very emotionally charged mm -hmm. uh, because patients generally don't grasp the disease and they uh, look at their scan and they think in their minds, so who can take this out for me? Yeah. So and what are you seeing on the scan? Do you see something that kind of woofs out like a spider web or um, does well, it still sit there like a lump? Uh, great uh, question. Uh, you can see on the scan uh, of a young lady um, who presented with uh, a focal motor seizure of her right arm. 
uh, and she couldn't pick up the baby anymore because of some dyspraxia. And on the scan, all you see is a small 1.5 centimeter area, which is fairly discreet, uh, but, but it's sitting right on the hand area of the motor cortex. And there are great progresses in MRI technology, and they can actually do spectroscopy now, which can uh, suggest high metabolic activity, high perfusion to suggest a uh, high-grade tumour. And someone like that, uh, it's a difficult conversation because, uh, first of all, all tumours are operable. Uh, anyone can take out any tumour. Yep. But it's a question of how much deficit is the surgeon willing to create and the patient willing to accept. Mm. Um, and um, a biopsy confirmed a high-grade glioma. Uh, the patient subsequently had radiation therapy and then subsequently went on to have a resection of that tumour in another centre, and uh, which obviously caused a monoplegia of the arm. Yeah. Uh, now, does that prolong survival? Coming back to your question, does it allow people to live longer? Um, first of all, surgery and chemotherapy and radiation therapy tends to increase your survival by 14 weeks. Now, are those 14 quality weeks of survival? I don't know, it's a philosophical question, isn't it? Uh, so it, it's a conversation you have and make an individual decision with each patient. Pretty tough job you've got. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, coming back to your question about what do they look like on MR, you can see on this other scan, also of a young lady, actually my age, uh, who presented with, again, a headache this time. Uh, and you can see that there's a multifocal nature to these tumours. Mm -hmm. So she's got a large lesion in the right parietal lobe, uh, which is resectable. But on closer inspection, you can see a high T2 signal in the brainstem and thalamus on the opposite side. Yeah. And it just brings me back to telling people that this is a diffuse disease we're dealing with. And what we see on the scan is not all there is to it at a cellular level. Mm -hmm. She went on to have a resection of that parietal lesion uh, there was a cystic recurrence some months later and there was some waxing and waning of the other lesions as she went through the chemotherapy, radiation therapy. And on progressive scans you can see that now there is even changes in the opposite temporal lobe. And with progressive neurological decline, uh, following multiple surgeries, uh, eventually with high grade tumours you come to that tipping point on whether it's sensible to go on or not. And it always comes to a point where it's either cognitive dysfunction or significant motor deficit which uh, slows you down and in those cases patients generally come to terms with their diagnosis and have uh, palliation measures. When these patients are in the palliative and terminal phase of their disease, are they still dying of a brain tumour or are these things that actually spread to other parts of the body like other cancers do? Uh, interestingly, generally high grade brain tumours remain localised uh, within uh, the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember reading a case report of a, a patient who died of a high grade glioma who went on to uh, donate her kidneys mm -hmm. and the kidneys in the recipient who's obviously immune suppressed developed glioma, which is quite interesting, just as a case report. But generally, they do not uh, metastasize uh, elsewhere. And with the patients who are having treatment, um, you said that maybe the low grade ones, you're actually looking at a, a cure or a very significant amount of palliation. How much disability in terms of things like personality change and cognitive change do you actually see? It, it comes down to the location. There's definitely a psychological predisposition and some people are just generally better at adapting to a really terrible decision that impacts on them and their family and their surrounds. Yeah. Uh, but for example, lesions in the basal ganglia, you can present with uh, emotional incontinence, uh, uncontrollable crying at the smallest thing. Um, and, but in a lot of other locations, it can be quite silent, you know, in the frontal lobe, particularly on the non-dominant right-hand side. Uh, patients can simply um, ha not, not notice anything at all. And you can do a, quite an aggressive frontal lobectomy and get a radiological clearance of the tumour with uh, little impact. Tell me about meningiomas, which are benign, benign in a non-benign space. <laughs> Uh, well, 
uh, it's still a difficult disease. Yep. For example, I'll, I'll show you this scan of an 80-year-old lady, independent, lives with a husband, who was referred to me with a large meningioma compressing her left hemisphere. Yep. It's five and a half centimetres. Uh, there's a lot of edema, but she's walking and talking. Now, she's fit and well. She's got years ahead of her. Ahead of her. And um, it's a difficult conversation at age 80, what do you do? And I went ahead and resected it. Uh, I achieved a total resection. It was a grade one tumour. And you can see on the post-operative scan, there's a, a hole and a bit of blood yep. where the tumour used to be. Uh, the motor cortex is preserved, but she developed a supplementary motor syndrome, meaning even though she's not hemiplegic, she's unable to initiate mo movement. Mm -hmm. In the weeks and months that it took for her to get better on that side, because she was bed bound, she, she, her muscles generally atrophied, and she remained a hoist transfer and is going to a nursing home. And on the flip side, you can, uh, I can show you another scan of a 44 year old man with visual loss. Yeah. And he's got a three centimeter planum sphenodali meningioma, which is on the uh, anterior fossa floor, just in front of the pituitary gland. And we achieved an endonasal resection. So through the nose, you can mm -hmm. go and do skull based tumors of the anterior fossa. So Total just resection. like a pituitary resection. Just like a pituitary, yeah. except now you're going intracranially, yeah. uh, resecting dura, and then having to reconstruct a big hole that you've created in the floor of the brain. And his vision improved, he went home, everyone's happy. So it's a big mix of uh, tumours in terms of location, size, the type of patient, and neurology. And more and, and a more, little bit of luck thrown in. Well, yes, uh, and, and careful planning. <laughs> uh, but more and more we're identifying especially extraaxial tumours early. Yep. Small meningiomas in the petroclival region, near the brainstem, completely asymptomatic and um, found incidentally. And these, once they start growing, I believe there's a strong role for radiosurgery. And uh, certainly with the cyber knife here, uh, more and more of these patients are receiving early treatment, which definitely works in uh, meningiomas in difficult to reach locations. Radiosurgery and cyber knife sounds, um, sounds pretty space age. Errol, what does it involve? Uh, look, it's been around for a long time. And uh, there are different ways of um, delivering radiation, but Unlike the conventional way, uh, this is uh, a similar dose of radiation to a very small volume and in a single dose. So it's not fractionated mm -hmm. over several weeks. Yep. It's a single sitting. And uh, there are different forms of radiation, whether it's gamma rays or still the uh, LINAC procedure with the accelerated mm -hmm. electrons. But ultimately, you're delivering high dose to a small volume. Yep. And the literature, it's been around for a long time. It definitely works in arresting tumor growth. And for vestibular schwannomas, that's been around for a very long time. Yep. So that's so another tool we have. This is some kind of um, radiation wave scalpel. It's actually a radiotherapy, it's radiotherapy, radiotherapy tool. No but cuts. It's minister oh, no cuts. No so cuts. you're not administering this. This goes through the radiotherapy department. It, it, in this country, yes. And certainly in the States, uh, neurosurgeons are trained in uh, administering it. And I constantly refer patients, who, which particularly small asymptomatic lesions, I think it should be the first line of treatment. It's not without its own complications. You can still cause cranial nerve deficit. Yeah. You still have important structures millimetres away from the tumour, but it definitely eliminates the morbidity of getting down there with the knife. So in the last couple of years, the things that have changed, genetic marking, yes. as in genetic testing, Yes. therapy? Uh, therapy hasn't really changed a lot. Uh, I think the future will be uh, genetic fingerprinting of tumours. Mm -hmm. Presently the WHO classification of brain tumours relies on a microscopic classification and historically before microscopy was prominent people simply classified them on what they looked like whether yeah. they were orange or rubbery or soft or firm. Yeah. So the advance will be uh, each tumour will first and foremost have a molecular fingerprint and in conjunction with the microscopy a decision will be made. And I think we're coming to accept that glioblastoma isn't uniform. We know that on clinical grounds, yeah. but I think on histological grounds and on genetic grounds, we'll see the same thing. So it's about categorizing it. Therapy-wise, I think in surgery, we're getting cleverer and cleverer. We can take things out through smaller and smaller incisions, which I believe is less traumatic to the patient and aids in the recovery. 
I think we are uh, treating diseases better now than 20 years ago. Uh, the prognosis hasn't changed for grade 4 gliomas. Uh, but we're getting better at technology and we're getting at better at understanding these tumours. So I think it's, it's just a matter of time. Thanks to Dr. Bala for once again taking the time to be on our program. Now, Dr. Kathy Cole is a paediatric oncologist who's been on our program many times. She joined medical oncologist Dr. Martin Buck and Dr. Olga Ward to discuss trends in the treatment and management of cancers in patients of all ages, especially in light of our emerging ability to genetically profile individual cancers. Kathy and Martin, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Oncology seems to have moved a really, really long way since I was a medical student when, you know, most of the patients died fairly quickly and a lot of things were a death sentence which now seem to have about a 90% five year survival. I'm very excited by the whole advances thing. Can you tell me um, what's, what's new and what's happening in the oncology field? I think most of the advances recently have been in the treatment of advanced disease, uh, yeah. particularly treatments uh, involving uh, uh, immunotherapy for melanoma. Uh, hopefully we'll be seeing some exciting new treatments for lung cancer, um, ovarian cancer and breast cancer. So I think we're getting better uh, results with our patients with uh, metastatic disease and turning cancer into more of a chronic condition rather than uh, a condition that when I was a medical student, people who were diagnosed with advanced cancer had a very limited lifespan and very limited opportunities for treatment. Yeah, so what you're talking about is say somebody who will live with cancer and some side effects and a lot of treatment but may live for 10 years, is that the, the kind of the way the therapy sure. is going? Well I often explain it to some of my patients that if you had diabetes you wouldn't just treat it for six months and then stop your treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, the diabetes will come back and it will cause you serious health issues. But in many cancers now, we might treat them for six months. We might then put them onto some kind of maintenance or ongoing treatment to keep their cancer in a dormant or an inactive state. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of treating it more of a chronic condition rather than an acute condition that requires treatment and then you can yeah. stop. And Cathy, is that also happening in paediatric cancer treatment? Um, a little bit, but by contrast, most of our improvements have been in curing patients. Of course, when you're a child, you've got a very long life expectancy and you don't want to live with cancer. Uh, and we've done that um, uh, through a collaboration with our national and international colleagues. So all of our patients are treated on trials of the large international cooperative groups. And by, by doing that, by treating them with uh, the current best therapy randomised against something slightly better, we've had this slow stepwise improvement mm -hmm. so that we've gone from 20%, as you say, to over 80% uh, cure, really, in children with cancer in the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, now, uh, by the same token, the treatments are toxic, uh, some particularly so, so brain irradiation, clearly we'd like to get rid of, and some of the newer, um, more... Uh, clever therapies, the so-called biologics or immunotherapies we hope now to bring in to get rid of a more blunderbuss mm -hmm. cytotoxics and radiation. Yeah. And now, so it's a really, it is an exciting time. It is. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the biologics and then I might go back to Martin and ask about some of the genetic therapies that are coming through. So biologics, are they kind of like the, the things that we're using for the rheumatoid arthritis, so the things uh, that end with MAB? Yes, so there's a, there are a lot of MABs which are the monoclonal antibodies and then there are the IBs which are the small molecules mm -hmm. and uh, they're basically designer therapies so that we're trying to attack a protein on the surface of the cell, an antigen, so um, probably the most commonly known one in cancer treatment is rituximab uh, which is used widely in lymphoma. Um, and is also used in many other non-malignant uh, mm. immune conditions. So, so what does it do? So it attaches to, uh, to B lymphocytes through yep. an antibody on the surface, CD20, um, and removes those cells from your body. So they okay, might so be... it's just basically attaching a flag that says eat me to the... That's right. Um, so now we've moved to, to a, a new system. stage in cancer where as well as attaching to the antibody on the surface of the cell, uh, the newer agents um, are called bispecific, so they have an, uh, a, 
they can attach to the CD20 or whatever on the surface of the cell and to your own T cells. So they're actually bringing our own immune killing cells to the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. So the first of these for leukaemia is now uh, available in early trials. Yeah. Um, but that's very exciting because yeah. just attaching to the cell may well not be enough. Um, it might keep things at bay for a little while, but it may not be enough to actually get rid of yeah. the cancer. And so, is this so this is using your own immunity yeah. <laughs> to kill the cancer. Is this a sole treatment or is this something that's used in conjunction with cytotoxic therapies? For most childhood tumours, they're very aggressive and yep. um, it is unlikely that we're going to be able to use them anytime soon on their own. Mm -hmm. Certainly we will start by adding them in to therapies, um, but it would be hoped that if we continue to get good results that we can cut back on our more toxic cytotoxic agents. Yep. Will we one day get to using uh, no cytotoxics? Perhaps. You hope. Yeah. And with the immunotherapies, I'm imagining that since there's a, a very large load of abnormal cells that are being um, consumed by the, the immune system, that you would get some kind of serum sickness reaction yeah. from? So we think of them as being non-toxic because you may not uh, get the nausea associated with regular chemotherapy and you don't lose your hair, but they're quite toxic in other ways. And mm -hmm. so yes, uh, serum sickness-like reaction is very common. Martin, what's happening in particularly ovarian cancer, which, um, which has always been a, a scary thing for GPs to talk about with patients? I think a lot, of it, uh, a lot of the changes now are leading on from the reduced cost in genetic uh, profiling. Yeah. I mean, it was only probably 15 years ago to do the entire human genome was a, a $50 million project that took five years in the United States to complete. Now we're looking at a full genetic profile uh, on an individual taking about 12 hours done by a machine that can crank out several of these in a, in a single day and maybe cost $200. So mm -hmm. I think we're only uh, a year or two away from that type of approach. So we're now getting at each patient's tumour individually typed, telling us more about the profile, telling us more about what drugs may be successful, what therapies in a genetic uh, way might be helpful. So having this available now for ovarian cancer is very helpful. We're in, we're in the two clinical trials at the moment in Perth in which we're doing complete genetic profiling of the tumour, having it reassessed uh, overseas to find drugs that are going to be perfectly suited to that patient. So mm -hmm. I think this is the way that we always wanted to see oncology travelling, individual therapy for the individual patient using the best drugs we have available. Yeah. And I think that the type of approach is, is now here and hopefully we can expand on it more and more. Yeah. And we were talking in a recent genetics program about the BRAC1 and 2 genes. Um, is that what's expressing on the ovarian cancers? Is that what you're looking for? Is it something different? Sure, no, I think uh, germline BRCA is probably uh, around 10% of uh, mm -hmm. ovarian malignancies or ovarian fallopian tube malignancies. Uh, but there is a certain type of bracha ness in which the tumour expresses BRCA characteristics but doesn't actually carry the BRCA germline mutation and this is uh, the focus of a couple of trials also that we're participating in where we're looking at uh, special uh, IB drugs rather than AB drugs, mm -hmm. the small molecule drugs are designed to inhibit the, the PARP uh, pathway inside the cancer cell and uh, we're finding that um, up to 40% of patients can, uh, 40 of patients with fallopian or ovarian cancer contain this BRCA-like uh, profile and will respond to these drugs. So we're looking at tablet forms of treatment rather than intravenous chemotherapy for many patients. Yeah. And Cathy, I saw you nodding. Is this something that's developing for children's tumours? So well? this has happened in uh, leukaemia where we've been looking at um, the genes in leukaemia for many, many years. But um, most people will be aware of the Philadelphia chromosome that we usually mm -hmm. um, associate with chronic myeloid leukaemia, but it is also associated with a particularly aggressive type of ALL, or common childhood leukaemia. And we're now finding exactly this, that there's a group of patients who are Philadelphia chromosome negative, but have the same gene profile as patients with the Philadelphia chromosome. Yep. And so our next move is to use the drugs that attack the um, chimeric um, protein in, the, in Philadelphia chromosome for those patients. So it is, it's an exciting time. Yeah. And 
I know when people are undergoing chemotherapy that they're incredibly fragile. Apart from that sort of acute flu-like kind of serum sickness thing, um, what are the downsides of these kinds of new therapies? Is there anything that's, that's kind of popping up that you think, oh, that's going to be a bit of a problem? Uh, well, I think uh, the, some of the problems with the immune therapies are that you can accelerate uh, the autoimmune conditions that the patient might have. So mm -hmm. some of these drugs you can't <coughs> use if you've already got something like SLE or some ac active autoimmune process because it will take the break off the immune system. So the drugs that are being used now for melanoma uh, release the break that's been on the T cells that the melanoma produces. Uh, so it, by making the T cells more active, if you've got uh, active uh, autoimmune problems, then these will become exacerbated and there are um, lots of reports of this being quite a serious problem in some patients. And you can also get things like autoimmune colitis and bowel problems, which, um, as Cathy said earlier, although they're not getting chemotherapy, they are still a whole new group of side effects that uh, we need to be aware of. And uh, I was at a meeting a, a few weeks ago uh, looking at these treatments in melanoma and uh, uh, the, the comment was that as an oncologist now you need to be an immunologist yeah. and, and most of the help that we get these days for these patients is often coming from our transplant colleagues who have got much more experience in treating autoimmune diseases and rejection than we have so it's kind of forged a whole new kind of form of cooperation to mm. treat these patients. Martin, melanoma is something that again GPs have a reasonable amount of experience with in terms of excising early melanomas and checking patients for melanomas. But once the jolly things spread, what can we say to the patients is available? And where do you send them? Like, do you send them to a plastic surgeon or a dermatologist or straight into the oncology department? Um, who, who manages melanoma that's starting to spread? Sure, I think that uh the early melanomas will always be in the realm of the, the general practitioner and the surgeon as far as appropriate operations and, and sentinel node uh, biopsies and removal. But for advanced disease, I think this is a rapidly evolving field at the moment. Uh, not only are we looking at uh, genetic mutations such as the BRAF gene, once again we've got an IB drug suitable for melanoma patients that carry the BRAF mutation, and many of those patients will have long and prolonged uh, remissions. That may, perhaps not cures, but once again turning it into a chronic condition. Mm -hmm. And for other patients who may not carry the BRAF mutation, we have a whole new uh, portfolio of anti-immune drugs uh, fo focused on the PDF1 uh, receptor, which is a, a receptor that melanoma carries, which enables it to inactivate your own body's immune system. And these new drugs are now inactivating that receptor so that the T cells can recognize and find melanoma. Uh, these uh, portfolio of drugs need expert attention. Uh, as I mentioned, that there are new kinds of side effects and problems to deal with. Uh, we have a very good melanoma unit at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital that's very active in clinical trials and at the forefront of a lot of studies being done around the world. I would certainly recommend that patients that have advanced disease are either seen by their oncologist or referred directly to the uh, melanoma unit at uh, Charlie's because I think there are so many options for these patients, they need to be very carefully selected, mm -hmm. making sure that there are clinical trials that are, that are appropriate, that they are given that opportunity to participate, and if not, there are still other drugs that we can use by compassionate access, which, which may be very effective. So that's a great example also <coughs> of the multidisciplinary approach, isn't it? The melanoma meetings where everyone's there and mm -hmm. can bring their patients to the discussion. Sounds like uh, there's some hope for our patients, even when we thought that there might be none. Sure. Well, I think just recently uh, you might have seen on the news that the, some of the new drugs have just been approved. Uh, they're very expensive. That's, that opens a whole Pandora's <laughs> box now of um, ha how much can we spend to treat patients with advanced cancer. And I think that there are going to be some difficulties in the health economics situation mm. trying to say, well, how these drugs are very expensive. They certainly can buy a lot of uh, extended lifespan for many patients, but yep. how do we judge how do we juggle the costs of, of these expensive treatments versus the cost of screening patients for breast cancer? You know, so yep. there's a lot of very difficult decisions that need to be made. Yeah, so Cathy, you're on the committee. How expensive is expensive? Well, some of these things are uh, sort of secrets between the, um, the companies and, uh, and the minister, so our committee is only giving advice. 
and there are a lot of complex negotiations that take place. Um, but they are expensive and uh, it's certainly um, something that's going to be discussed, I think, today in the, mm-hmm. uh, in the Premier's meetings uh, at, uh, at the Commonwealth, yeah. um, how we're going to afford to continue healthcare at this level into the future. I was uh, at a meeting, uh, as I said recently, when they were talking about the cost of some of these newer drugs and that it was estimated for advanced lung cancer in the United States was going to cost $14 billion uh, to treat the current patients in America who have advanced lung cancer Mm -hmm. who are eligible for these new PD-L1 drugs. And of that $14 billion, $8 billion would be spent on patients that wouldn't respond to treatment. So not everybody responds to treatment. So you've, you've committed $8 billion to administer a treatment mm-hmm. to a patient to patients that won't respond. But so the only way at the moment of knowing whether they're going to respond is to suck it and see. Correct. So ah. I think that's where the... <laughs> but as once we again, learn genetic, more about the yeah. biology, it'll be more focused. Sure. Yeah. Once we get our genetic profiling and we get more experience and we look at more patients, hopefully we can select the ones where the money is well spent as opposed to patients where the money is not so well spent. Yeah. We've been lucky in Australia in that with our PBS model, we are actually able to negotiate um, price as well. And that's one of the things that we're keen not to lose in the free trade agreement. So yep. hence, uh, that's always talked about in the paper. Uh-huh. Now, we're talking about patients surviving their cancer and maybe surviving their childhood cancer and then going on to have a happy, active adult life. What are the long-term effects of them having had cancer therapy, say in childhood or say in middle adulthood? Um, do they get second primaries or a lot of infertility or what are the other issues that so there maybe are, we should switch into? As so there are there's certainly issues for survivors. There are different levels of issues depending on firstly the tumour that they've had and the um, intensity of the treatment. Uh, so many patients who've been through fairly straightforward treatment, say for childhood leukaemia, um, can be assured of virtually a normal life uh, and are um, easily fit for normal medical follow-up with their GP. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have patients who've had very intensive therapy, including radiation, who need specialist follow-up. And they are at high risk of second malignancies. Um, perhaps because they've already shown a propensity to malignancy, but undoubtedly mm-hmm. as a result of the treatments. So um, when you say second malignancy, what would we have on our radar as their GP, given that country patients don't often like to keep going down to Perth? So leukaemias, so yep. um, treatment-induced AML, myeloid mm-hmm. leukaemia, um, and then um, tumours in the radiation field, I guess, are the two mm-hmm. most common areas. Um, But more than that, because children are growing, uh, there are effects on treatment. So um, particularly the children who've had brain radiation will have effects on their hypothalamic pituitary axis. So endocrinologic follow-up is huge, actually, Mm -hmm. in our patients um, at that end of the spectrum and also in our bone marrow transplant patients. Um, uh, Clearly, a thyroid disease is one thing where you can find it when it's... uh, pre-symptomatic, mm-hmm. um, so screening for that's important in anyone who's had uh, yeah. radiation um, and some of the drugs. Some of the drugs will affect um, heart function later in life and this may not be for 30 or 40 years, um, particularly uh, say in um, young uh, girls who've had ad- adriamycin or dornamycin who then turn up pregnant and in heart failure and so we're now trying to go back and capture all these people and make sure that they're aware that they do need cardiac follow-up mm-hmm. and particularly in pregnancy. And that's because of the pregnancy hormones or just because of the extra I think it's just cardiovascular the, yep, um, circulatory the extra cardiac load. output in a heart that's been treated with this anthracycline group of drugs. Yep. We do know a lot more about limiting the doses than perhaps we did uh, 20 years ago but even so Mm. There's a lot more to find out about yeah. long-term follow-up. And of course it's now 20 years later from 20 years ago. Exactly. The infertility one is, uh, is tricky because it is sort of such a long time into the future. And I try and be a positive by sort of saying, well, look, you know, we're talking about 25 years' time. Look what's happened in the last 25 years to the treatments for infertility. We're not um, yet very good about um, preventing the effects of drugs in pubertal or post-pubertal children, although the pre-pubertal children are probably somewhat protected. Um, 
Uh, so I think things will move along in that field, but we're not yet at the point where we can store um, ovarian tissue very easily and have successful pregnancies come out the other end. Mm. So it's, uh, it is a tricky area. Yeah. Of course, the children are not very interested in that, but their <coughs> parents are very interested. Yeah. Martin, what do you see in the, in the sort of more adult population? I think we're in a better position than Cathy's patients because often our patients are only getting a short course of adjuvant chemotherapy following the resection of a breast cancer or a bowel cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the <coughs> drugs they receive in a short period of time don't really have a lot of long-term uh, problems. So we still run into problems with hormonal suppression in, in female patients and the risk of early menopause in ladies with uh, breast cancer who have mm -hmm. been treated. Uh, but overall, adjuvant treatment doesn't tend to cause a lot of long-term problems, very rarely myelodysplasia. Uh, in our patients with advanced disease, although they're living longer, they often don't really get a time frame in which they're going to be at risk of a second malignancy or, or major problems, say, with cardiac function mm -hmm. down the track. So uh, advanced disease patients who are getting chemotherapy on and off over many years, uh, the least of their problems is probably the risk of developing another cancer of a different variety. Yeah. What about the um, slightly younger group that I think all GPs are, are now becoming very aware of, which is the younger group of women in their 20s and 30s who are coming up with um, fairly aggressive breast cancers and maybe still haven't finished having their family or even haven't started having their family. Mm. Um, is there something that one can offer them? They're always a very difficult group to treat. Uh, often they haven't started their family, as you say, and <coughs> they've got a very keen uh, interest in later on uh, starting a family and you've already just treated them with aggressive uh, chemotherapy. You're also concerned that you don't want someone to start a family and then have the risk of their disease recurring at that point. Uh, so there's uh, uh, often a line in the sand drawn that's saying that uh, perhaps you should be free of cancer for at least two or three years before you, you should embark upon trying to have a family even though you've probably got some compromised ovarian function. Um, that, that group of patients, I think, uh, will always be a difficult group, and I, I don't think there are any simple solutions. Uh, we often try to put them into ovarian suppression during chemotherapy. They uh, use something like Zolodex to put their ovaries into a resting phase mm -hmm. while they have chemotherapy, and that way they're less susceptible to the effects of the chemotherapy drugs. And that's certainly helpful in, in women who are very keen to start a family and are having chemotherapy for the first time. Yep. Um, but, now, uh, Kathy said that freezing ovarian tissue is not terribly successful. I've had a couple of patients who've asked about it, um, given that it's not going from, say, childhood to 25 years, but you might just be going for uh, leaving it for three or four years. Um, better success or not much it's job? All, it's often difficult because that process of putting someone through uh, a few cycles of ovarian stimulation and then harvesting uh, uh, eggs or ovarian tissue often puts a, a delay into the treatment of their disease. So mm -hmm. you might not want to wait six weeks before you start them on treatment or eight weeks, depending on how long it takes. So it is a difficult uh, path to follow and uh, we don't really have a, a standard way of, of telling patients, oh yes, we can take some of your ovarian tissue and we can freeze it. I, I don't think it's an option really at the moment. In general practice, sometimes it's difficult, particularly in the country, to know what kind of workup would be useful for a patient who you think probably has a malignancy but you're not quite sure um, you know what sort of testing they need and what you can get done locally before they present to the oncology team uh, what would you say was a, a useful workup with kids it's usually pretty easy we ring you up and go help well it is pretty straightforward because <laughs> they usually either present with things that make you do a blood count or with a lump or with some uh, symptoms referable to brain tumours. And, um, uh, and so usually it, it's not difficult. Um, certainly we have patients who've had ultrasounds or CTs before they come into us. Mm -hmm. Because you have to remember that there's only 100 children a year diagnosed with childhood malignancy, and so they're all able to come to us at PMH and, and be managed in the system. And it's really quite different in the adult setting with such an enormous age range yep. as well. So. Oh, I think that uh, I find over my career that the, the amount of work that the general practitioners are doing now to present a patient to you is much, uh, much more extensive than it was in the past and uh, it's quite common now to see patients uh, referred to you with uh, recent imaging, CT scans done at a big regional centre, uh, 
uh, and appropriate workup with the, the necessary blood tests and tumour markers. I think that uh, it's, um, uh, it's quite easy for, for GPs now to have access to a lot of things that probably were a lot more yeah. difficult in the old days when there were very few uh, scanning uh, possibilities arranged. Uh, these days we use a PET scan a lot. Uh, you'll find that PET scans are very uh, helpful in staging a lot of cancers now, either preoperatively or in the management of the, yeah. the progress of the tumour, even in lymphoma. Uh, that, so of course, that, won't be something that a GP can sure, request. Sure, but, but giving, get, getting all the information to us so that we can decide whether what other further imaging would be necessary mm -hmm. and trying to cut down the amount of travel time for regional patients is very important. We now have PET scans even in Bunbury as a regional centre. So I don't think that those type of tests are you know, too far mm. away for people now. Now, when you were talking about tumour markers, um, I'm not right up on tumour markers. Is it appropriate for us to just take some, some serum and get the lab to store it so that you can tell them what tumour markers to request? Or Sure, I think we still use we a lot of those tumour markers that have been around since we were students, you know, the CEA, the CA125 and the CA153 and yep. the, the CA199 for pancreatic cancer. Uh, often when a patient's been referred with an adenocarcinoma of uncertain etiology, having those tumour markers, uh, when you see the patient, can be helpful in mm -hmm. targeting what other tests you think might be appropriate. And uh, so I think that's a good routine thing to do. Yep. I, I guess related to that, one of the problems that I see as a fairly isolated country GP is communication between myself and the oncology unit. I feel like you send them a ginormous package of information and they send you back something that says your patient has been enrolled in a trial um, and then every now and then you'll get a generic trial flyer but most of the information that comes back comes back from the patient or from what the patient understands rather than, than from the unit. Um, how are those communication lines managed? Very strictly in our <laughs> unit and still very badly. So people get threatened with not being able to go on leave if they haven't done their letters. But uh, anyway, no, we're, uh, there is always more information that could go out. And in terms of, of things like knowing what to do if the patient, say, goes down to a regional centre or down to Perth for some fairly major treatment and then comes back to their farm, mm. the panic thing for a GP is, of course, the patient comes in and goes, I've got a bit of a fever and I think I might have a cold. Mm. Of course, you're, you're looking at them with great suspicion, thinking, have you got a cold? Have you got pneumonia? Have you got meningitis? <laughs> have you, um, you know, what are the, the common things that you see that maybe we should look out for? Well, I think a septic patient's always a medical emergency, whether it's in the rural centre or, on, or yeah. in the metropolitan area. So I think that... Uh, Clearly yeah. septic and then there's the kind sure, of... Sure, it's, mm. it's more the borderline patient that comes in with a slight temperature and a little bit of a cough and you're not quite sure whether this is very serious or just slightly serious. Yep. And uh, often a full blood count is a very good way of determining whether you can be more conservative or more aggressive, mm -hmm. checking to see if the neutrophil count is low or high. Uh, if there's a low neutrophil count and a patient's got a, a temperature of over 38, then really it has to be uh, uh, a yeah, transfer to... To a regional centre for intravenous antibiotics and appropriate management. If the patient's got a bit of a temperature and they've got plenty of neutrophils, then you can look at oral antibiotics and a very close clinical review of the patient over the mm -hmm. subsequent few days. But now, yes. In my teeny weeny little rural hospital, where I might get their, their blood count back, if I wanted to start them on an intravenous antibiotic, say, um, I mean, obviously, I don't have meropenem. I might be able to get keftriaxone or tobramycin or, you know, gingivitis or something. Yep. Are they fine as a, a kind of a Absolutely. first line thing? Yes. The other things that, that we see are trying to manage the side effects of chemo, and particularly patients who've had a lot of nausea, and I can prescribe them a whole four tablets of ondansetron. Um, have you got any really good tips and tricks for chemo side effects? Nausea is not as big an issue as it used to be. I mean, no. coming from an era uh, when <laughs> oh. I did oncology that uh, our anti-emetic uh, portfolio was limited to one or two drugs, um, we've now reached a stage where amongst most patients, the chance of you getting major issues with nausea and vomiting or requiring intravenous hydration, those type of situations would be a very rare circumstance. Uh, 
I think less than 10% of patients would have major nausea issues on current chemotherapy and antiemetic programs. So I think we're much better off than we used to be. Uh, there's still the occasional patient who is recalcitrant to anti-nausea medication and uh, unfortunately the drugs like ondansetron which you mentioned uh, uh, often don't mix very well with the intravenous antiemetics we give at the time of treatment, mm -hmm. uh, mainly to do with uh, bowel stasis and severe constipation because the intravenous drugs will cause good anti-nausea control but prolonged uh, constipation for yep. four or five days and if you add ondansetron into that mix at the same time then these patients often have quite serious uh, uh, so constipation issues. Trade off one thing for a different exactly. thing. Exactly, so I think ondansetron is a drug which we don't use a lot. Uh, uh, a w if you're nauseated a week after chemotherapy it's not the chemotherapy. Yep. It could be gastric uh, irritation, it could be uh, other issues that are causing the nausea. So. Uh, having access to not a lot of bondansetron, which is the way of the world, uh, mm -hmm. might might not be a big issue. Yeah. It's more for radiation treatment where you're having something every day over six weeks where you can access increased amounts of bondansetron through the authority system if you need to get better, yeah. longer supplies. And what about the patients who've um, like got a brain secondary? which is something I've recently had to deal with um, and I resorted in the end to a really old-fashioned haloperidol infusion which actually worked quite well along with the, the very last ampule of dexamethasone <laughs> in the hospital. <laughs> any advance on that or any better ideas? Uh, I think uh, brain secondaries causing nausea and vomiting is always a trap for everybody, oncologists yeah. and general practitioners. and. Often it's attributed that oh, it must be the chemotherapy that's causing you to be sick, yep. even though it's two weeks after you had the chemotherapy. I think you need to have some kind of alert level if patients are complaining of nausea uh, <coughs> more than a week after their treatment. There may be other factors in play, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And a high index of suspicion, patients that have headache and uh, unsteady or difficulty with their vision, all those things are pointing towards it being raised intracranial pressure rather than just post-chemotherapy nausea. Start the patient on steroids, you've got nothing to lose while you wait for the appropriate imaging. And other things that, that patients are experiencing, you mentioned constipation, standard oral things? Oh, I happen to use a lot of uh, lactulose, I find that very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, often many Don't of our... find it causes an awful lot of wind? Yeah, I think that's an often, a common complaint. Um, often amongst the patients with advanced cancer who are having chemotherapy, you've got a few things at play, you've got the constipating effects of the chemotherapy. They're often on narcotics, mm -hmm. uh, pain medication. They're often inactive. They're not up and about very much to stimulate their bowel activity. So you've got a, a kind of a portfolio of problems that all conspire and that uh, uh, patients are very uh, thankful if you've appropriately managed constipation issues because it mm -hmm. can be quite a, uh, you know, a draining problem for them. And uh, I use a lot of lactulose, but sometimes you need to throw two or three drugs into the mix to try and get patients to uh, overcome that problem. Yeah. Is it a hassle for small children? It is for some of our treatment protocols um, and for some children, but similar sorts of treatment, lactulose is kind of still the backbone. Mm -hmm. Popcorn's a good source of uh, fibre that kids will eat. Yep. Well, that's a, a, a useful tip. <laughs> and. Um, what about the complementary therapies that all the patients seem to either swear by or their relatives swear by or somebody convinces them that they've got to have green juices or um, strange complementary things? Are there some common um, complementary therapies or um, herbal items that you see the patients taking? And is there anything that's a really big problem that the GP should know about to advise the patient not to use? I tell the children not to take anything they don't like the taste of, um, which is a good thing to do, gives them a little bit of power. Yep. Um, more seriously, uh, we do worry about things like high dose vitamin C, particularly if they're on other drugs that, are, uh, that will stress the kidneys, so methotrexate and so on. Mm -hmm. Also the backbone of anti-leukaemia therapy, which is our most common disease, are antifolates. So we don't want so people don't being on excess amounts of folates. So. 15, 15 kilos of processed yes. kale. Well, yeah. Generally the kids will uh, refuse to have it if they don't like it. Oh, that's good, Martin. Is there anything that you see that... Oh, I think uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, 
the negative effects of the internet kind of come to play in this situation. You often find that patients are in their spare time uh, trawling to find other helpful things to treat their cancer and uh, will often discover something and they have family and friends who are doing the same thing and recommending that they take something Peruvian pineapple or whatever it might be. Yep. And uh, I, I think uh, many surveys confirm that the 90% of patients at least are taking something that they may or may not tell their general practitioner or oncologist about. Uh, occasionally there might be interactions with some of these newer drugs, the Ib, the Ib drugs that we mentioned earlier on, the small yep. molecules. There are some indications that there are uh, negative effects of some of the uh, supplements that we need to be aware of. So I think all our patients should be encouraged to be forthcoming in what they're taking. Yep. At least tell us uh, so we've got some idea whether or not it's a good idea. Um, funnily enough, simple things like grapefruit juice may interact with some of the, the newer chemotherapy, uh, or not so much chemotherapy, but anti-cancer medication. So I think honesty and, and full disclosure is very important mm -hmm. for our patients these days, particularly when yeah. we're dealing with new drugs and new ways of treating cancer that may have interactions that we're not so familiar with. Okay, so that's something that maybe the general practitioner could do is to put into the referral letter is thinking about taking high dose aloe vera juice or whatever. Sure. Are there any of those complementary therapies that are actually really helpful? Uh, the, there's not a lot of clinical trials in that area. It's a bit of an evidence-free zone in some ways. Uh, I mean, vitamin C, as uh, Cathy mentioned, has been looked at in the past. It does provide a temporary um, boost to uh, general well-being for patients that are having chemotherapy, but in low doses. Um, there are so it's not, okay to let them take a gram, but just not 16 I tell, grams. I tell many of my patients... Orange they can take, for breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> either oranges or you know, a fi less than 500 Vena. milligrams of vitamin C. It might provide some temporary improvement. I think you've got to let patients do some of this because it does give them some control of their disease because mm. otherwise, whether it's with their child or whether it's themselves, they feel as though that they're just being swept into this vortex of medical advice that they have no control over. Yeah. So if you let patients kind of make some decisions and say, well, these are some of the things that you could take. Why don't you go to the, your health food provider and, and get some of these things, they're fine, uh, multivitamins, etc." cetera. Uh, so it gives the patient a little bit of uh, uh, control over their otherwise what seems to be a fairly uncontrollable journey through their, their treatment program. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I agree that really anything that helps people get through the treatment we really want them to have because there's the science behind it yep. is helpful. But what Tim Minchin said, if it worked, it would be called medicine, not alternative medicine. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and finally, how do you transition from active oncology treatment to palliative care? And when, who decides when to do that? I think the general practitioner is key. I think that the GPs often see the patient a lot more than the specialist is and that many patients with advanced cancer uh, reach a point where uh, the benefits of pushing on with systemic treatment of their advanced disease is probably uh, very small uh, in terms of quality of life and, and general overall family management of the disease. And, I certainly get the palliative care doctors involved when I find that the patient's in hospital with another complication or another problem and that it looks like uh, trying to offer further systemic treatment is not a good idea. Uh, mm. We've got very good relationships with our palliative care specialists, uh, certainly in public hospitals and the private hospital system. We'll often get them involved, perhaps not at the point of last resort, but you know somewhere mm. along the process where we feel that it might be of some benefit in pain management or uh, uh, providing care at home through the Silver Chain Hospice Service. Uh, and I think that most of the time, I think the transition process is, is fairly well handled and uh, the general practitioner often will uh, have some role to play by saying, contacting us and saying, look, I think we're probably at the point where we should get Silver Chain involved. And I think we just have to work as a team. As mm -hmm. Cathy mentioned earlier, the multidisciplinary approach is very helpful for these patients with ongoing problems and that uh, having uh, trying to keep the general practitioner informed with uh, appropriate correspondence is always um, a, a tricky issue but uh, mm. you generally you're only uh, generally a phone call away yeah so I mean I guess it's a little easier for us with the older patients with kids I guess that must be uh 
unfortunately, Pretty difficult decision. Um, we don't have very many patients uh, who die of childhood malignancy, but we still have some. Um, it is a small number so that we're able to kind of stay in touch with the families rather than having them referring on to another team, which probably makes the transition a little less obvious and so perhaps a little easier. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I can't uh, um, say how wonderful it is to have Silver Chain. We're so lucky in Western Australia to be able to have that level of care for patients to, to be at home. It's yeah. fantastic. They're, yeah, they're what happens unbelievably when you country good. patients? Well, I mean, I think, you know, this is what we need. We, it, the more we can support that uh, group to continue and to spread throughout the state, the better. It's extraordinary. Mm. I know that the um, uh, Chief Medical Officer is aware of, of how good they are and uh, so I think we have to keep pressing for that. Oh. And any final comments from either of you? About? Oh, I think that um, uh, oncology or the treatment of advanced adult cancers as well as uh, childhood cancers has come through a, a fantastic evolution in this last 10 years. We've now got access to many uh, therapeutic approaches that were have been thought to be science fiction not that long mm. ago. Genetic testing, finding a designer drug to fit a, fit a specific cancer problem and being able to give the patient a, a good long-term outlook with an advanced cancer. I think that very exciting times at the moment with the use of the uh, immunotherapies for melanoma, lung cancer and a whole bevy of other cancers which may be well suitable. So I think that uh, it's not anywhere near as a pessimistic an outcome as it might have been in the past. Okay. And yeah. um, It's really just the same, that it, uh, it's always been an exciting area to work in for me and it remains so now and I think uh, in the future it is well. Thanks to Dr Cathy Cole and to Dr Martin Buck. Finally tonight we hear from radiation oncologist Dr Raphael Chi. I had recently caught up with Dr Chi at the Cancer Centre at Fiona Stanley Hospital and he spoke about how the technology surrounding brachytherapy, particularly the imaging associated with treatment planning, has evolved in recent years. Raph, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. Brachytherapy seems to be a bit of an old-fashioned kind of um, therapy but it seems to be making a resurgence. Can you just talk us through what it is and, and why that is? Yeah, it is. Um, going back to history, um, Brachytherapy as treatment for cancer has been around since the 1920s yep. and if um, everyone knows who Marie Curie is and she's basically the first practitioner of brachytherapy and her daughter and son-in-law took that up in a, in a Marie Curie hospital in, in Paris after that. So it's been going for a long time. The concepts hasn't changed. What's changed has been the techniques and the uh, planning that we have uh, which made brachytherapy a comeback. Now, um, probably up until about five, ten years ago, well, in Australia probably about five years ago, the planning techniques for brachytherapy is very, um, I guess, it's, it's unsophisticated. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, we, what we've experienced for patients is that although it's, it's uh, very effective for controlling cancers locally, um, patients do tend, tend to get a lot of side effects from it and the side effects are permanent and it's quality are life changing. Mm. And although it is early days, but in my experience, the new brachytherapy techniques that we've been able to employ in terms of uh, three-dimensional planning has made an, a significant improvement in, in side effect profile. Now, so there's not actual difference in, in the actual treatment modality, it is about the planning it and is being about the selective. Planning. Correct, yes. Everything in, in radiotherapy um, or radiation therapy, there's no we, we cannot change the properties of what we used to treat. That's been around since Earth was born. Uh, but what we can do is, uh, is, is um, change how we deliver uh, the treatment to the patient. And, and all, our aim always has been to treat, deliver high doses to all the cancer without treating any of the normal tissue. That's always been the uh, holy grail of radiotherapy. And, and you know, we are slowly getting there. Um, Brachytherapy sounds archaic, and, and it is, uh, because it's you know it's it's a it's a uh, it's an old-fashioned technique, uh, which is now brought into the modern world. Um, but 
it is still what we call what is, it is still the most conformal way of delivering radiation treatment uh, for patients. All right. Um, so patients can have very effective cancer kill uh, with uh, low in, in low toxicity in general. Yeah. yeah. So the basic principle is still the same. You get some radioactive material Correct. and yep. you actually implant it where Correct. locally where the, yeah. the cancer is. Uh, so what's different then? The, is it the imaging? Is it the, the imaging's different? Um, so say for example in Perth, up until three or four years ago, we've only used X-rays. Uh, plain x-rays uh, in theatre to help us guide where the applicators are uh, in relation to the tumour and in relation to the, the organs at risk. Um, my specialty is in gynaecology oncology so my concern is with you know, cervix cancer in brachytherapy and so in terms of the organs it's the rectum and the bladder. Um, what we can't see are things like small bowel, the sigmoid colon and invariably uh, those organs get um, heavily treated as well because they, we don't know where they are. We can't see them in the x-rays. Mm. But we've been using MRI and CT scan for planning. And, and there's software now we can actually, um, we, we, we can modify the way the dose is delivered um, in, to some extent. And by doing so, we know that we can actually cover the, the tumour still and bring dose away from the bladder, away from the rectum, away from the sigmoid and small bowel. And that way we can actually minimise side effects. And, and, and the beauty about brachytherapy is that, uh, or brachy is Greek for short. Um, so that means the radiation treatment travels very, very short distances. So it falls off outside your target very quickly. So it spares a lot of normal tissue. Um, as opposed to our, our usual workhorse, which is a, a big x-ray machine, where it treats basically everything as it goes through into the target. So this is... Um, an MRI with the applica in situ. So you, you can see this is the cervix that we want to treat. That's a part of the uterus. And you can applica that sits through the vaginal canal and into the, um, um, into the uh, uh, cervix canal. And another equipment that sits just outside to give the dose. Uh, what we've outlined we can see is the rectum, the sigmoid and the bladder and small bowel. So we use this to help plan and modify or optimise our, our, our dose so that we can actually treat the main tumour and try to bring dose away or take dose away from the, 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 the normal organs. So this, this image is taken on the first day. A uh, patient has an MRI and that gets electronically transferred to us. And then we use that to plan, plan our treatment. So the whole planning process at the one takes is probably about between 30 to 40 minutes. The brachytherapy dose that's that, that's delivered is still a symmetrical uh, distribution. So we do not, at the moment, do not have a way to make it directional. Um, there are uh, research teams looking at how we can actually deliver directional um, brachytherapy dose um, that will be even, you know, provide even a, a better uh, dose, dose avoidance for normal tissues down the track. So you can see, if you look at the, I don't know how well you can see that, the red colour is where the full dose is. And you can see that we've been able to bring it all in so that we can actually avoid the rectum, avoid the uh, bladder, and avoid the, uh, the sigmoid colon. So this patient's treatment is actually very good where 100% of the dose has been delivered to the uh, tumour and very, very little dose being delivered to the organs at risk. So I'm expecting this patient not to get, to, not to get any significant side effects from her treatment. So then talk to me about um, what types of cancers uh, might be suitable and how people are screened okay. and assessed for appropriate. Right. So in, um, um, at the moment, um, cervix cancers um, and uh, uterine cancers in the post-operative setting and prostate cancers are the, are the, the main uh, cancer groups uh, that we use brachytherapy for. Um, increasingly, uh, people are using it for skin, skin cancers. Um, and also in a palliative setting, we've also been using it to treat uh, esophagus cancers, lung cancers centrally, uh, where they've run out of options. All right. Okay. So you can look at um, two types of patients. One patient, a group of patients, is to use brachytherapy to treat with curative intent. Mm -hmm. So these are usually the cases of uh, skin cancers, cervix cancers, and um, uterine cancers, and, um, and prostate cancers. So we tend to reserve for prostate cancers, we tend to reserve uh, brachytherapy for very high, very aggressive cancers, uh, where we know that the dose using the linear accelerators that we can give, we don't think it's high enough mm. to be able to, to eradicate those cancers, so we need something stronger. Mm. 
and that's where brachytherapy comes in. For locally advanced cervix cancers um, and uterine cancers, uh, brachytherapy is more or less the uh, standard treatment, but uh, adjunct to all the other treatments they're going to get. So is it uh, usually done in isolation or is it used as part of a, a, a regime with chemo and other modalities? So the, the, when we give brachytherapy itself, it's normally done on its own, mm -hmm. um, but it is part of a treatment plan. So the plan usually involves chemotherapy, external beam radiotherapy, where we need to treat uh, you know, other parts of the, the, the body uh, at risk, and then using the brachytherapy, as, as the term that we use is a boost, so an extra dose mm -hmm. um, to the main part of the, the, the primary site, because that, that primary site is usually the area that harbors the most number of cancer cells, and so you need more dose. So essentially what I'm understanding of this yeah. is that it's a modality that can deliver a very high dose yes. in a very local area. Correct. Uh, and, and in circumstances where that's needed, yep. it's an option. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and at the same time sparing toxicity, sparing uh, dose to, to the surrounding normal tissue. So it's a, it's a way of giving very, very high doses of radiotherapy without causing too much damage, essentially. So the, brachy, the brachytherapy suite is actually quite specialised. So we've got... Uh, Thick concrete wall which is shielded, big heavy shielded doors. And this is all shielding. So patient actually comes in here and this is actually the uh, the machine, the what we call the afterloader. Um, funnily enough, this thing is this thing is really heavy. And this is all heavily shielded then. And inside of this sits a uh, radioactive seed, probably the size of a rice grain in there. And it's all um, delivered, it's all attached to a piece of wire. So it's all computer control. And once it's ready, it actually pushes the uh, seeds out through all these channels and into the patient. And the, how much treatment or how long the treatment goes, it depends on the age of the radioactive seed. So the older it is, the slower, it slows down with time. So uh, the longer the treatment's gonna be. Um, the seed that we use is Iridium 192 and it has a working life of about three to four months. So every, about th every three to four months, we swap over to a new one. The actual treatment itself, the patient's actually in the brachytherapy suite on their own. Uh, once, uh, the trip, once, uh, once it's ready, we actually leave the room, close the door for shielding purposes, and it's all remotely controlled from, from the other control room and, and, and treatment's carried out uh, remotely. So how successful is it? You talked about it being you know, a curative option for some right. cancers. How successful is it? Um, so in, in the example that I, that I, I use uh, in, in my specialty in cervix cancers, um, without, sometimes we can't perform the brachytherapy um, treatment because of um, um, you know, other circumstances, like technically uh, we just can't do it, or patient's not fit for it, or... Um, or we run into due to complications during the procedure, we have to abandon. Uh, in that case, uh, we then boost with more external beam, but the dose is not as high, or we, that we can give as safe that we can compared to brachytherapy. Mm -hmm. So in that circumstances, uh, what in in our ex in w, the W experience, the cure rate dropped by thirty percent if we cannot do brachytherapy. Yeah, right. So that's quite significant. Yeah. So what kind of um, side effects during therapy and afterwards are people looking at? Um, so during, during the trip, so the brachytherapy is normally given several times. Um, so we give it twice a week uh, for four sessions, that's over two weeks, okay? So for, because it is, although it is an invasive procedure or it is minimally invasive, so in immediate post-treatment phase, we look out for things like bleeding, discharge, um, infection. Um, so that's what we look out for. Uh, they're very, very uncommon. Um, they're very, they're quite easily treated if it happens. Mm -hmm. In the long term, um, there's still issues with potential risk to the bowel and the bladder if, in, if it's in the pelvis. So uh, we look out for things like uh, rectal urgency, poor control. Um, they t can get things like uh, bleeding um, when, they, when they void or bleeding um, uh, when, when, when you open the bowel, so we need to check that out. So there's those side effects, but the, those side effects are common in just about any of the modalities. Correct, so, correct. So how, how does it compare? It's probably not different. Mm. So brachytherapy for, in the last decade, was, the way I look at it, was going to be a loss, loss art. 
because they are the fancy um, equipment and software for the external beer has been has been you know arising, and there was a, you know there was a thought that no one's going to do brachytherapy anymore because you know if we've got a non-invasive way of doing it, but um, in the last for the last five or six years, um, the new things coming up with brachytherapy, how we actually plan and deliver it, and um, and we still find up to now it's still being the most effective way of trying to kill off cancer cells. Yeah. Uh, if you can do it, so we, we can't use brachytherapy for, for every situation. Um, it's only where we can uh, safely access um, the the cancer. So things like cervix cancer is easy because you've got a, a cavity through the the womb that you can insert alplicatus in. Mm. Uh, prostate easy to access because it's quite you know close to the surface, I guess surface of the skin, which is a perineum. Um, what you can and, and skin because it's on the surface it's easy and things like esophagus and, and, and trachea where we can actually introduce tubes down the, uh, the lumen uh, we can actually access that quite easily as well so you know um, so it's not for every, not for everything um, most, of, most of the brachytherapy is using a radioactive um, seed to deliver the treatment uh, but there are also now developments looking at using uh, electronic x-rays uh, to actually deliver this brachytherapy so in Perth, we've got an equipment called Intrabeam, which is used for early stage breast cancer. And um, that's probably come up in the news uh, quite recently. Um, there's also developments in using um, um, elect um, electronic tubes to deliver the brachytherapy. Not, so the advantage of using electronic is the, uh, the safety, um, because you're not dealing with a radioactive substance. So the safety of the staff is, 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 is improved and you don't have the issue of trying to have a specialised room uh, where you shield the radioactivity. It's no longer a nuclear medicine. Correct. Yes. Uh, is that still um, implant based though? Not necessarily. So um, it depends on circumstances. If, if, what, if what you're trying to treat is in soft tissue without any um, lumen or cavity, then you have to implant using you know, interstitial needles. But if you've got a, a, an area that, that's, that's surrounding a, a, a cavity or a lumen, like you know, cervix um, or, um, or esophagus or bowel duct or trachea, then you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cavitary treatment. Yeah, you can just take, yeah, take the wires there and correct. deliver correct. the treatment. Yeah, like, say for example, esophagus is just put in nasogastric tube down mm -hmm. and you work out what you want to treat. That's all we have time for in this webcast. Thanks to Dr. Chi and to all our guests, Dr. Arul Bala, Dr. Kathy Cole, and Dr. Martin Buck for sharing their time and their extensive expertise. And thanks to you for joining us. We'll be back next time with a special webcast focusing on allergy and immunology. I'm Simon Stokes, hope to see you then.